In this segment, we are going to talk about the historical fall and its radically comprehensive consequences. And the point I'm going to make is just how crucial it is for us as believers in understanding how the historical fall of Adam and Eve explains so much of life, whether it's in here or out there. Uh, the explanatory power of the fall is just astonishing. And it's interesting. It depends upon which Christian circles you're in. Uh, it will depend upon how much talk of the fall there is. Because in some circles, they talk about it a lot. In other circles, um, not so much, or perhaps none at all, or at least very little. And there needs to be a happy medium. Um, certainly the Bible gives a lot of prominence to the fall. So what I'd like to do tonight is to look at the... Um, at the consequences of the fall, not to go into the detail of the fall itself, but the consequences of the fall. And hopefully it will help all of us to understand the world that we live in more as a result. So, after the creation, which we just talked about in our last segment, after the creation of the universe and Adam and Eve's sin, the fall occurred, and we, we all know that Satan tempted Adam and Eve, and, and they um, fell into that temptation, and they gave in. Uh, I'm going to return soon to what it means to be made in God's image, but you know the story about the fall, and I'm, I insist, you know, according to Scripture, that this... Uh, this fall occurred in space and time, because the Bible insists that it did. It's not, it's not some mythological fairy tale. Adam and Eve disobeyed the direct command of God. Um, we have no idea how long they remained in the garden before being tempted and sinning. Um, and as I said at the outset, um, my intent is not to look at the temptation uh, or the fall itself, but the consequences, and focus on that. So, first thing I would say is that this event, that is the fall, did occur in real space-time history. Um, as Adam and Eve were real people, Jesus affirmed Adam's historicity, uh, as well as the historicity of the fall. The prophets affirmed uh, the historicity of uh, Adam and the fall, as well as the apostles. Jesus is seen as the second man and the last Adam. So if we question the reality, historical reality, the first Adam, then we're really messing up with something very serious, and that's the atonement, because if we deny the historical nature of the first Adam, whose sin was said to be imputed to us, then we're breaking down the parallel between what is talked about in Romans 5, between Adam's sin being imputed to us and, and then our sin being imputed to Christ on the cross and his sin being imputed to us as our representative, just as Adam was. So, it's a serious thing to do not deny the historicity of Adam. Um, secondly, we uh, do not speak nearly as often as we should of the reality and the comprehensive extent of the effects of the fall. We basically uh, pay it lip service and let it go. But, y'all, it altered everything about the world, not just spiritually, 
The curse of the fall has extended its tendrils into every nook and cranny of the universe, on the macro level and on the micro level. Indeed, the very cosmos itself groans as a result of their sin, the fall, as we see in Romans 8. But I maintain that your experience of of the exterior world, the external world outside of us, as well as your experience of inside your own head and in your own psychological life, um, your own psyche, will remain largely mysterious and obtuse, uh, just um, filled with kind of a, a cloud of fog if we lose sight of the full ramifications of the fall. The fall literally bent everything. We live in a fallen world, friends. But what does that mean? Well, for one, it means that absolutely nothing is perfect in this world. Everything is imperfect and, and bent in some way. As it says in Ecclesiastes, God made this world straight and we sin made it bent. Sentiment's paraphrase. Um, and the, the fall does have enormous explanatory power, as we're going to see. Frankly, what we sometimes blame Satan for is simply due to living in a fallen world. If we um, ever consciously or unconsciously set up an either or between perfection or nothing, we always get nothing in a fallen world. Whether if we're, whether we're talking about a perfect church, a perfect potential marriage partner, uh, a perfect work, work environment, uh, you fill in the blank. If we ever set up an either or between perfection or nothing, and this can go on on an unconscious level, every time we'll get nothing because there is no such thing as perfection in, the, in this life. In, uh, in any area, the only perfection we have experience with is the Lord Jesus. Everything has been bent to some degree. That is, it has its uh, equivalent of thorns and thistles of some kind. Okay, now let's go through some of the specific consequences of the fall. And you might find this um, eye-opening. It was for me the first time I heard it. Number one. And this is one that most people are, are familiar with. The, the first, the most primary and the most serious consequence of the fall of Adam and Eve is that mankind was separated from God. Now, I don't have time to read Genesis 1 through 4, which is our text for all these consequences or separations that we're going to see. But we're going, going to be alluding to the to them. <clears throat> but we're told um, that the fall is the origin of spiritual death. What was threatened in chapter 2, verse 17, became a reality in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, in where we see Adam and Eve hiding from the very God whom they used to walk intimately with in the garden. It's just a tragic scene. This was and is the worst consequence because in Romans 5 and elsewhere, we see that Adam's sin as a federal head of the human race was imputed, imputed to all of his posterity. Since the fall, all people enter this world united with Adam and are spiritually dead. We enter the world as spiritual zombies, biologically alive, but spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1 and following. And we do find the 
salvation as it's spoken of in what's called the Proto-Evangelion in chapter 3, verse 15. Um, but that assumes, obviously, that uh, we need a Savior. We do need to speak more of the nature of this sin and how it was imputed to us the radical corrupt, the corruption that ensued from Adam's sin and its effect on us spiritually, and we're going we're to do that soon. All right, now closely bound up with that is the second consequence is physical death. We see that again, the threat in chapter 2, verse 17, where God says, if you eat of the tree, on that day you will die. And in chapter 3, verse 19, we see God carrying that out. But instead of killing them instantly, instantly and immediately as God said that he would and as they deserved, the Lord graciously extended their lives. Yet, this does explain the origin of human death as well as suffering and disease. And that is huge, my friends. Some of you, no, I should say all of us deal with suffering on some level. It's just that some of you or us may be going through a crisis at this particular period. And it's much more on the front burner um, as far as the suffering of a loved one or of yourself. But we, we must remember that death is abnormal. The world would tell us that death is unfortunate, but it's just an inevitable fact of life, a result of just the evolutionary cycle. But clearly, according to God's word, there is a discontinuity between the world as God created it in the world we live in now, or to state it in, in another way, the world we live in now is not normal. It is abnormal. This is tremendously important because of how it explains the origin of physical death and how God can be good, all-powerful, and yet, there still be the presence of death and suffering in this world. It's the only way that we can give a adequate explanation for this, uh, probably the, the most um, powerful argument and objection that people raise against the Christian faith is the problem of suffering and death, physical death. Let me use a story. Um, I read a book one time by Albert Camus, the French uh, atheistic existentialist, to illustrate this issue. It was entitled The Plague. You may have heard of it. In a nutshell, there was a priest who lived in a village. And one day, a terrible plague broke out in the village. There was enormous suffering and death, and the priest felt an agonizing dilemma because, in his mind, since God made the world as it is, then if he helped those who were suffering, then he would be fighting against God. But if he obeyed God by letting God's nature run its course, then he would be obeying God, but betraying his beloved villagers who needed him and who were suffering. And in the novel, he ended up helping the, the villagers. But you see the point there? Is if the world that we live in now is normal, it, that is, it's the way that God made it, the world that we live in with all its suffering, death, and disease, then, in a, in a very real sense, Camus has got a point. If we were to fight against disease, we'd be fighting against the world that God made. But the way that God made the world originally was perfect, Genesis 1.31. And behold, 
um, it was very good. I mean, everything was literally perfect. There was no physical death. And we it, physical death is a consequence of this. Do you feel the dilemma that Camus is um, facing or presenting to us? If this world and all its death and suffering is normal, if it is as God made it, then we have no basis for fighting against it, and we have no way of explaining how God can be good in light of this awful suffering that we experience. But the fall gives us a titanic answer. It explains that the world we live in is abnormal, death is abnormal, and think of Jesus standing before Lazarus' tomb. He not only wept, but in the Greek, there were two emotions he expressed, sorrow and anger. Because when he was confronting the death of his friend, it was like it was encapsulating all the horror of the abnormality of death as it was presented um, in his dear friend Lazarus. And it angered him because Jesus, as the creator of the world, it saddened and angered him to see uh, just this consequence of, of the fall. So death is the violent disruption of the vibrant flow of life, the ripping asunder of what God had joined together, the soul and the body. So the fall gives us an explanation, an incredible explanation for the problem of evil. The original creation was deathless and perfect, and we messed it up. So that's, that is an, an amazing answer that, that we do have to give modern man uh, in explaining how God can be uh, all-powerful, good, and yet there be suffering in the world. And I can hear some of you asking this question, and it's legitimate. Well, what about God's knowledge of the fall prior to it? I don't have time to stop here to deal with that. It's a legitimate issue. It is. All I can do is deal with the reality that, that we are living in now, tonight, and not jump into more abstractions um, at this point. Okay, number three. Not only was man separated from God, I'm saying man, I'm talking about mankind, but thirdly, mankind was separated from himself. That is, the, the consequence of the fall is that man was separated from himself. See what I mean, Mark? Talking about the origin of psychological problems. Do you really think that perfect humans had deep psychological issues? I don't think so. In chapter 3, verses 7 and 10, you see the expressions of psychological trauma. Whereas prior to the fall... They were naked and unashamed, but after they, after the fall, they were naked and ashamed. It's just terrible. And nakedness in the Bible is a profound motif, which expresses how the entry of sin introduced shame and guilt feelings. And we know how, what a number both of those can do on us psychologically. But since the fall, everyone born into this world, except the Lord Jesus, was born with cracks in their psyches. I'll say it again. Since the fall, everyone born was born with cracks in their psyches. We all have psychological issues, some worse than others. We can be unintentionally cruel to people, like Job's counselors, if we try to attribute all emotional psychological issues with the demonic. Uh, 
Now, can the demonic cause psychological problems? Absolutely. Can they piggyback on them? Absolutely. I've been dealing with the demonic and deliverance the last 10 years. I've seen it. But I want to talk about the fall because I think we need to get some balance in our understanding of reality because there's a lot of people who have pain, suffering, disease, and so forth simply because of the fact that we live in a fallen world. If theoretically there was not a demon in the world, there would still be all sorts of psychological, physical problems because we live in a radically fallen world. Some deliverance ministers need a refresher course on the comprehensive effects of the fall so they will not be trying to toss out a demon which is simply caused by an imbalance in brain chemistry. I don't know about you, but not a day goes by that I am not acutely aware of my own psychological brokenness. And I have one or two particular psychological issues that go back to when I was 17, when my brother died, which I'm not going to go into detail about. But every one of you who's listening to this has psychological issues. And as I said, I know that when we enter into this world, we all have what I have called for 40 years cracks in our psyches. Hopefully this will help y'all in understanding your own experience. Some inherited, um, when I'm talking about this psychological brokenness, some of that brokenness is, is inherited, uh, it's genetic, some of it's caused by life's battering ram, or a confluence of the two, as it was in my case. I don't have time to develop this, but the gospel can bring substantial healing to some psychological issues, especially those that revolve around guilt feelings. Remember, justification deals directly with forgiving our guilt, and guilt feelings flow from objective guilt before a holy God. And being guilty before a holy God, that's where, as I said, the guilty feelings often ensue. They should. So, as it says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But, just want to, again, affirm that one of the terrible consequences of the fall is that mankind was separated from himself, and that explains the origins of psychological and emotional issues. Fourthly, Another consequence of the fall is that man was separated from other men. Origin of sociological problems or man's inhumanity to man. Inhumanity to man. Um, we can see this with Adam accusing Eve in chapter 3, verse 12, where he basically says, um, Well, God is the woman you gave me. And I can almost can almost hear the argument that it ensued from that, right? But then, you know, on a much more um, vicious scale, we see Cain um, killing Abel in chapter four, verse eight, fratricide, brother. So we have. Um, humans being separated from God humans being separated from themselves, humans being separated from other folks. Here again, the origin of sociological or relational problems or man's inhumanity to man. Um, so God's very good creation in 131 has degenerated terribly due to the fall. The lovely fields of Edenic paradise have turned into a killing fields because of the fall. Number five, the fall caused man to be separated from nature. 
which explains the origin of environmental problems and the fear between animals and humans. We see this in 3.17 and following. We are called to be the vice regents and stewards of God's environment. And we're called to the cultural mandate to take care of God's nature. But one of the results of the fall is that we see in um, 317, if I can read that, is that... Um, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, and so forth. So, there is um, the, the, the onset of environmental problems, and our um, proper role as God's stewards has so often, as you know, degenerated into uh, selfish, uh, as some people would put it, the, the, the raping of creation, God's good creation. We're, we are to deal tenderly um, on, a, on, on the level of creaturehood. You know, we're equal with the animals as far as being fellow creatures. Now we're um, qualitatively different from any other creatures as far as our being made in God's image. <clears throat> That's for sure. But the point is, is that we've been called to, because of being made in God's image, to take care of creation. But because of the fall uh, and the sin that uh, came with that, that it was imputed to us that uh, totally despoiled our human nature um, we have uh, it caused two things again the pollution of nature and then the fear the strange odd fear between humans and uh, animals which I guess we come we have come to take for granted but it's not always that too is abnormal I should say sixthly there's also, as a consequence of the fall, is that nature has been separated from nature. Not only have we been separated from nature, but nature has itself been separated from nature. Or nature has been separated from itself. In other words, because of the fall, we see the origin of violence between God's creatures. You know, early on in chapter 1, it talked about how the diet of both humans and animals was to be uh, vegetarian. Um, not so after the fall. So we have the origin of violence and decay in creation as a consequence of the fall. You see that in uh, 1.29 and then 30. And then, uh, of course, as I mentioned, Romans 8 personified it, we see is a pitiful picture of, of the entire cosmos the universe groaning because of what we did in a, in Adam and we were never better represented than when Adam um, represented us in the garden well I should say we uh, we were better than with Jesus but as far as at that point, we couldn't have been better represented. As the poet said, nature is red in tooth and claw. Carnivorous activity, there's survival of the strongest. That is a result of the fall. And we will have animals in heaven, but they won't be gnawing on each other. <coughs> then lastly, um, the one I've been dealing with so much is that uh, man has been separated from the evil angels and there's been a conflict between us and them as well as the followers of Christ and those of Satan uh, in the beginning of the um, God's talk at the very beginning after the fall he's cursing Satan and uh, there is a the statement there made about how there's going to be a God-ordained 
uh, antithesis or animosity between the seed of Satan, seed of Satan, the serpent, and the seed of the woman, that is, believers in Christ. So essentially what it boils down to is we have the origin of spiritual warfare in uh, chapter 3, verse 15. Now, have, have you seen how comprehensive effect these effects are? Do, do you see that now? Let me read them again. Man separated from God, which is, explains the origin of spiritual problems, that is spiritual death. These are all the separations. Okay, the fall explains man's separation from God. Origin of physical death and disease. Man separated from others. The origin of relational conflict and violence. Man separated from himself. The origin of psychological problems. Man separated from nature. Origin of pollution and the fear between us and animals. Separation of nature from nature. Origin of violence in nature. So... Um, again, I just ask, it's, we usually focus on Adam's sin and how it affects us spiritually, and that is primary. And it's what plunged us into radical ruin and spiritual death. But do you see now how the fall sheds so much light on us as well as the world we live in? It really, really helps to explain the world that you and I live in as well as the world inside of each one of us, the fall, as far as the weaknesses, the bentedness that we all see in everything, including ourselves. So it's my prayer that we would recapture a biblical and a deeper understanding of the reality and the effects of the fall and how that accents the beauty of the cosmic scope of Christ's redemption. Because all those separations that I talked about, all they do then is to show how much more rich Christ's death is than just dealing with our being separated from God, that being, of course, infinitely more important than anything else. But the, go the goal of the drama of redemption is to not just restore the pristine glory of Eden, but much further, paradise will be here on earth a renewed heaven and earth. We see this in Revelation 21 and 22, Second Peter. And though the world is fallen, it's still very, very lovely. And the beauty and order of it is not just to be used as a proof of existence, the existence of God. Um, it's just flat out beautiful. And it's something that God wants us to rejoice in and to enjoy. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is, has the truth that explains everything that we need to know that is it's sufficient for us your word is we don't need to go to any other book or anything else and I'm thinking particularly how the, the doctrine of the fall how uh, much explanatory power that has in opening our eyes to the various issues that we face on a daily basis which would include dealing with ourselves so thank you for that in your kindness and love you have spoken to us so clearly about this world because otherwise we would be in the dark.
So we love you, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.